colleagues, educationalists, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here today to address this forum. And before I say anything, Your Excellency, allow me just to recognize some of my colleagues who have given me a mandate uh, to chair the Kenya Secondary School Heads Association and also other sister associations that we collaborate with very much on matters education. Uh, with me, I have uh, representatives from Kepsha, and I know I have the former chairman here uh, of Kepsha, Mr. Gademia, his team, Kindly Wave. Uh, we also have um, Kesha officials, uh, our secretary, national secretary, Mr. Kuria, is here. I have the chairman of Kewata, Kenya Women Teachers Association, is here. Uh, I have Shak. Uh, Shak is the Special Schools Heads Association. The former treasurer is here. And apart from that, we also have our unionists here, Kupet and Nat, uh, represented. And we have uh, teachers from all over the country. My colleague teachers, please just stand. I know you are there. Just stand. And, and uh, yeah. So uh, uh, these are the people, Your Excellency, uh, that um, have allowed me uh, to participate on their behalf on matters education. As I stand here this morning, I would like to share with you and the forum on matters of um, uh, basic education. Your Excellency, you've articulated it very well, and even the person who, uh, Daktari, who gave us uh, the preamble, uh, really did indicate that education is the key driver. If we want to progress as a country, if we want our economy to be good, then an educated citizen is key. A good education system is very important. And for us to be able to ensure that our students and our citizens are well educated, we must invest a lot in the training. We must invest a lot in quality training of the key driver, the teachers. The people seated before, uh, behind you, sir, majority are teachers, and they agree with me that the quality of training how they are empowered and how they are employed becomes very key. As Kenya Kwanzaa uh, 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 takes over government, it will be important to first think of the gap in the teaching. At the moment, as principals and head teachers of various institutions, we are lacking the number of teachers that are required. I know there are very many out there that are waiting to be employed but it would be important to first address the very needy, the gap that is there. When we last checked, our shortfall is about 116, 118 thousand teachers. This would be very important that immediately they are employed to be able to take care of uh, uh, the 100% transition, to be able to take care as we prepare for junior secondary students that are coming to us, and then eventually ensure that those teachers that are out there waiting to be employed are employed and employed very quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, as we look at the employment of teachers, a good teacher and a teacher that is going to deliver the curriculum the way it is must be happy, must be healthy. It would be important to look at how do we enumerate them. How is their medical cover? Is it able to take care when they fall sick? At the moment, there are challenges because at times uh, when they go for treatment, you are told that this insurance cannot manage one, two, three. So it would be important to look at their, the health status of our teachers. It is also important to look at the issues to do with their continuous training. A bone of contention that we have today, which I want to present to you to think about it, is the issues of the continuous training through the TPD program. That is now being said that the teachers will have to finance for themselves. That 
is a bone of contention. I would like to recommend that as we prepare and continuously train them, let this continuous training be borne by the government. So that as a, when the government feels that I need to be retooled, they need to pay and ensure that I'm ready to continue working. The issues uh, uh, to do with um, safety. We are aware that across the country, some of the areas are now facing a shortfall because of the insecurity in the area. It will be important that the safety of both the learner and the students, uh, the learner and the teachers uh, are addressed so that the teacher feels comfortable, the teacher knows that uh, my responsibility is at this level and that there is somebody else to ensure that I'm, I'm safe. It is the responsibility of government to ensure that the security of every citizen is key. The issue of remuneration, I'll address issues to do with the teachers, then move to other areas. The issues of enumeration are very important. A well-resourced, a well-tooled teacher, and finally, a well-paid teacher will deliver the curriculum to the level that the government would like to look at it. Our proposal, sir, is that immediately you take over, can you look at the, allow the stakeholders to further discuss on the CBA? Because the CBA that uh, has been there, the teachers out there call it the maternity CBA. Yes, it is true. When uh, our partners deliver, we also must be available to support them, to ensure that they are strong enough. Then we continue with work. But in addition to that, the teacher will always want to see how much has been increased on my pay. So I want to request that immediately... Uh, propose that immediately you take over government, let Teacher Service Commission, our unions, take over and discuss the CBA afresh. And I think this cuts across the entire sector of education, from basic education up to tertiary education. I'm sure as my friends come to share, this will be repeated several times. Um, the issues of uh, facilities in our institutions. When I talk of facilities, I'm not only looking at infrastructure, the classroom alone. That is key. But one big issue that we must look at, and as we look at the sciences, how are we developing the infrastructure in terms of laboratories, the infrastructure in terms of libraries for research, the infrastructure in terms of technology. Because as we move forward, technology, we need to leverage on technology. And the biggest challenge that we have in these areas, Your Excellency, is uh, the internet connectivity. When corona hit us, we all closed schools and we closed learning. Eventually, we realized that learning must continue and we started sending uh, lessons uh, to students via phones. So the school was now in the phone. But when they come to school, we tell them don't come with the phones. So it will be important for us to leverage on technology. So that should we face another shock in the education sector, we do not close schools and close learning. Schools can be closed, but learning should be able to continue. It is our proposal that um, issues on uh, internet connectivity uh, be looked into so that the tariff or the charges that go with internet connectivity are brought down for purposes of teaching and learning. A 100% transition policy by government today is good. This ensures that all our children uh, go to school. But what challenges have we faced with a 100% policy? The biggest challenge has been overstretched facilities on a certain cadre of schools. 
that ends up with so many students because they believe in that kind of schools, there will be quality education. But if you look at data, 70% of our schools in the nation are day schools. And consequently, the largest number of students in our country are found in day schools. The challenge has been that these day schools have not been well facilitated in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, uh, staffing, uh, and therefore they, they end up not having the students that they need. Students now run away to the schools that they feel, or parents, the schools that they feel are well resourced. It is our recommendation that we should invest more in our day schools. Equip them well, resource them, and then staff them so that students and parents can have confidence to take their children to the primary schools, uh, I mean the day schools that are closer to them. Because we are saying, as we move these children to junior secondary, and I happen to have been a member of the tax force. One of the recommendations we were saying that uh, junior secondary should be primarily day school. But now with the crave which the Kenyans have for boarding schools, it, is, it means that we may not achieve that unless we invest more in our day schools. So for us to achieve it, our recommendations, let us invest more in our day schools. Your Excellency, the government policy on capitation <clears throat> is good because it ensures that uh, every child has a percentage of uh, money that ensures this child is in school. And as I said, in day schools, it would be almost completely free apart from boarding schools where the parents have to pay for boarding services. So this 100% uh, uh, policy and the number of students expected to be in those institutions, we still have disparities. And that is what we need to, uh, to seriously uh, look into to ensure that uh, the policy and capitation is, uh, is right. And how are we going to do this? We propose, Your Excellency, that um, when it comes to issues of uh, utilities, and here I'm looking at electricity, water, uh, as I've already mentioned, internet connectivity, and many other utilities that the schools use. Schools are charged for use of electricity at a market price. So you find that uh, a school that is large enough are paying up to about 800,000 per month on electricity. This is a very big chunk. So that even if government is giving capitation, the same government through Kenya Power is receiving this money. And therefore, the schools are left to be challenged. You look at water, the same. You look at sewerage services, we pay very heavily. Our proposal is that uh, could we look at special tariffs for learning institutions? And I'm saying learning institutions because I believe from ECD up to our universities will require this special kind of arrangement. How will it benefit us? One, you may not need to now increase capitation because they are going to be paying less for service provided by institu institutions of government, Kenya Power, Kenya Water, and all that. When we pay low, then it means the schools, through the capitation government has been given, will be able to have enough money to do other other things. And for boarding schools, it will be important to look at um, how do we cushion these schools with the 
fluctuating uh, market prices of food items, the grains, maize and beans, sugar. Uh, it would be important now, maybe as a policy, uh, that we look at how uh, KCPB and other institutions can come in to sell this commodity to schools at a highly subsidized price. With the large populations that we have, we will buy more. The farmer will have an opportunity to supply to KCPB because there is ready market in our schools. You will have introduced the free feeding programs from ECD and some areas in the ASAL areas, and I believe it will trickle down all the way up to the farmer who is growing this. We want to appreciate, sir, the partners who have come in to support government in ensuring that children go to school through bursaries. I have in mind equity, uh, KCB, um, Jomo Kenyatta, very many other organizations, CDFs, individual people coming in to support needy children. As uh, principals, we have noticed that uh, one student can end up benefiting from multiple sponsors. CDF has given these students something. Uh, a church organization has given the students something. Maybe uh, the parent was following up with the equity and the equity also sends. So you find this one child benefiting at the expense of a, a very needy child who has not been reached. So that at the end of maybe a period of four years or so, you find a parent coming to tell you that um, my son has excess fees. And true, the fees is now excess. The next question he says that because it was money for my child and he has now cleared, can you refund? The question has been, whom do I refund? Do I refund the organizations that were sponsoring or do I refund the parent? And that is why it is important for us to find a way of having a central control system that is robust, that when a Limu scholar from government gives in the Muli the student the scholarship, that data is available somewhere. If Honorable Sosion wants to give in the Muli a scholarship, can query the data, and the data will tell him in the Muli is being sponsored, so you don't need to add any more sponsors. Equity is sponsoring student X. KCB does not need to sponsor the same because there is somewhere central where this information can be found. That is very important. And I'm sure through that we will be able to reach very many needy Kenyan children who are sometimes left out because uh, uh, we were not able uh, to get some of this data on time. And also, as we give out our capitation, we are cognizant of the fact that not all our schools are well populated. I am in a school that uh, is privileged to have 2,145 students. If you give me 1,000 per child, I'll be able to have 2 million. But there are others which have only 100 students. When you give them 1,000 uh, per child, uh, this school will only, make will only get 100,000. But the two schools are supposed to offer the same services. The two schools are supposed to source from the same market teaching and learning materials. But government has given capitation of 1,000 across board. We feel we must look at um, something that we can model almost to the equalization fund uh, of uh, uh, county governments. So that schools that have very low population, can you think 
of a way in which they can be supported with an additional fund to be able to uh, support them grow. That one is something we can think about as a, as a nation and find a way, uh, a way forward. As I've already said, uh, that um, uh, the introduction of special tariffs, it is also important to note that as we integrate our children, both those with special needs with the normal ones, we need to think more about children with special needs. I think as a nation, and this I must confess, we have not thought much about children with special needs. So we need to engage more with the associations that deal with it. As I said, we have SHAC uh, that deals with the special needs education uh, uh, teachers, and those will give us more uh, insights uh, to it in terms of infrastructure and in terms of uh, what kind of facilities they need. As I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, you've talked about uh, engagement uh, with stakeholders in terms of um, changing uh, or looking and improving on our education system. We truly want to uh, say that is the way to go. I know it is five years now, we will be looking again to improve on the CBC. Uh, we know the teething issues that it is there, but as you said, it is the way to go. So it is important uh, that we engage more with the stakeholders, the teachers, the clergy, and those that offer education to ensure that uh, as we make these changes, we are carrying everybody along so that we don't have any dissenting voices. And lastly is the empowerment of the board of management in our schools. We have board of management in our schools across the board, uh, but uh, we've not empowered them enough to be able to take decisions. Always the decisions are left pending, waiting for maybe the Ministry of Education to come and pronounce on those decisions they have made. Then the question is, why do we appoint them? Then we don't give them the powers to execute. It would be important for that, and especially on matters of discipline in our institutions. The discipline in our institutions of late has been going down because the boards of management have no powers of ensuring uh, that uh, this discipline is maintained in terms of Uh, government coming up with regulations to operationalize the uh, Children's Act in our schools uh, and other regulations that put more responsibility on the child when they are in learning institutions rather than only looking at the right of the child and not adding and what is their responsibility. I know there are quite a number of people who would like to contribute to us this. Uh, I believe at the end of it, uh, I have my colleague there from uh, uh, Kewata who would want to say a word, I know at the end, there's two sentences, and my colleagues, uh, Kuria and Tim, they are also here. Uh, you will allow me, Your Excellency, mm. after everybody has presented, they can add one or two mm. in terms of basic education. Otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for listening to me, and may God bless you. Uh, Mwalimu, yes. sorry, uh, sorry. Okay. I, I just want to understand a bit of, uh, because um, we want to have a charter finally. Yes. You know? We want to have an agreement of, of, uh, that is going to be written. So yes. I, I know you have, um, you've talked about uh, different enrollments. Yes. A thousand, maybe two thousand, but there's a school that has a hundred, maybe two hundred. And yet they are supposed to hire certain standard services, whether you have a thousand or two thousand students, yes. or whether you have one hundred, you will need a secretary, you will need a bazaar, you need so many of those 
whether, well, and, and sometimes it becomes very difficult when you have 100 students. I yes. think that's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying, yes. So you're suggesting, for example, that we should have maybe a minimum essential package yes. to run a school. That is what we are saying. A minimum essential package yes. that is standard. That is standard. Then anything on top will depend on the kind of population yeah. the school has. Okay. But if we only go by population alone, we will always, the schools that are down there yes. will continue to remain down there. Okay. Yeah. And, and that is what is contributing to inequality in, uh, in education. That's why parents are taking their kids yes. to schools, the big schools, because uh, they, 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 they can deploy the resources they get better and get quality, yes. while on the other side, we should be building more access by making sure mm. that we grow the smaller, the, smaller the, smaller, schools. the smaller schools. Because if we want to increase access, the we smaller must, schools must, must be grown. Must survive. Because they will be available, yeah. they'll be closer to the population, Correct. They'll be close, children will be closer home, yes. and the parents will have confidence yes. to take a child to the school closer Mm -hmm. rather than struggling yes. to uh, take a child to Alliance, yes. Machakos, yes. Or where, yes. which will be far away, yeah. so they have to spend on traveling. Yes. Uh, they have to spend, again, more because uh, they have to pay for boarding services. But if we grow the smaller schools, Correct. bring them up in terms of infrastructure, mm -hmm. in terms of um, um, uh, well-resourced uh, and available teacher, yes. uh, then the parents will build confidence. So essentially, uh, having a minimum uh, package that is essential for a school to, to exist and to, uh, to grow will improve access because then, then you are you're making even the small schools available yes. and most of them are largely day schools, so that they are cheaper. True. They are cheaper. So instead of a parent, mm -hmm. so it's they, essentially bottom up. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> very true. They are, they are cheaper, so the, the people will come. Very true. I totally agree with you, and that is the the, the concept that we, we we are having here, and that is our proposal: grow oh. the schools in the grassroots. Yes. And you may not need that child to leave that village hmm. looking for a school several kilometers away because it is well resourced. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so, um, on, on again the matter of uh, infrastructure. Yes. At the moment, uh, counties, uh, county governments, let me say, hmm. uh, by virtue of operation of their law and the constitution, they are constrained from deploying county resources in putting up education infrastructure except in ECD. Yes. Would then be your suggestion that maybe we can, we can open up, you know, the counties, mm -hmm. where counties feel that there is pressure from the public uh, and the resources from national government are not adequate mm -hmm. we can open up the county government space for them to deploy county resources in putting up infrastructure. School, inf school infrastructure that one is uh, true because yeah. though the law has uh, indicated uh, that um, county governments are only dealing with ecds and i and i think another sector there uh, but the same law allows for public participation if the governor and his team engage in public participation and the public is telling them that school A in our area really requires extra classrooms, I think through public participation and is agreed, the county government should be allowed to, to, to help in building the infrastructure. That should be a way to go so that we are building these things uh, uh, together both the county government and national government. So that nobody looks at it as a governor, I don't say that is not my responsibility. Yet, 
the children are local. The children belong to that county. Yeah? So if as a county government we are saying secondary school um, A, and allow me to use uh, school at home, maybe my Honorable Msalia would understand it better. Uh, Ivona uh, Secondary School is a, is a day school. And my county uh, governor says uh, he cannot put resources as Ivona Secondary because it belongs to the national government. 78% of the children going to Ivona Secondary School are from the, the locality. Yeah? The governor is the governor of that local area. So he cannot abdicate. He or she cannot abdicate some responsibility because the law has said, let us allow public participation. The law should be flexible yeah, to allow governors to engage the public. And if the public say, we need two classrooms here in this secondary school, in this primary school, then it should be done. Yeah. Okay, Mwalimu. And uh, maybe finally, and... Uh, uh, I'm not trying to harass you, but no, 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 no. no. I'm, 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 I'm just okay. trying to, to see, I'm, to understand. You are a professional. You are a practitioner, mm -hmm. so you know better than I do. Um, I was in a school in uh, Wajia, um, in a place called Tarbach, about three weeks ago. Yes. And I, I spoke to one of the teachers there, and. Um, Majority of the teachers in that school were, I think I met a teacher from Bomet, and I met a teacher from uh, Moranga. Mm -hmm. And it is contributing to this constant problem of uh, schools in, especially Northern Kenya. As a teacher, yes. what would you recommend? Because oh, while I was at the Ministry of Education, we tried to provide affirmative action in teacher training for people coming from localities in northern Kenya mm -hmm. because it is contributing to the, the low standards of education in northern Kenya that most of the teachers are from very far. So whenever there is a challenge, the teachers go away and the students are stranded. What would you, as a practitioner and as a, as a leader of, uh, of the teaching fraternity, um, suggest to policymakers like us in terms of getting the communities there to appreciate that they need to make a contribution of people who can be trained so that they can, understanding the locality and the challenges thereof, they can better deliver education to children in those localities. What are your thoughts? Do you, well, what do you think? Um, every child in Kenya requires uh, a trained teacher across. I may not really advocate for what we call the affirmative action so that the teachers uh, in those areas maybe are taken in at uh, Lower, uh, lower entry point, for example. Because eventually this teacher will need to teach elsewhere in Kenya. We may not just go and find them there. My view would be government must ensure security for all Kenyans and for the people up there. <laughs> Secondly, we can enumerate this teacher slightly better. I'm, I'm borrowing a leaf from uh, some times back when uh, we didn't have enough teachers of science in the country. What did government do? Uh, it, uh, it ensured that uh, when you are graduating and get into the teaching profession and you are a science teacher, uh, your salary was a, a few shillings higher than one who was not a science teacher. Could we say, therefore, in these areas that are challenging and uh, a teacher A is posted there, can we add something on top of his salary? Because no, in Northeastern, 
There are teachers from elsewhere, but they are in private schools. Why are they there? And in public schools, the teachers have run away. They are there because they are better paid. So we do the same here. Yeah. So, uh, precisely, that was, I, I was asking that question. So the affirmative action is in paying yes. a little bit more. A little bit more. So that uh, we can retain teachers in those areas. But yes. the primary thing is we must provide security. We must provide security yeah. for the teachers to be there. Uh, let me also, maybe let me ask uh, uh, differently, because I have had engagement with uh, leaders from yes. northern Kenya. And we try to persuade them that the community in northern Kenya, mostly, they are not keen on the teaching profession. Yes. Do you have any thoughts on how we can encourage local communities to, 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 to understand that being available to teach is, is a noble profession? And, and how do, uh, and then a, a mechanism for us to encourage them. Maybe the one you have suggested on maybe paying them paying better, them better. Would, would work. Or even um, uh, we can look at um, uh, from, for children in that area. You, 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 the government can get out of uh, its way and say, uh, children from Northeastern who have qualified and are going to take education to become teachers, they will go into training fully funded by government. Yeah. So that they don't have to pay anything. It's an incentive to them uh, because they'll feel, okay, now I'll go to the university, study, and I'll not pay. And I'll not be charged even later to, to, to pay. Let it be like a, a full government-sponsored scholarship for them. But I'm, uh, what I'm not agreeing is we can't lower the grades for them. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, fully, I fully support what you're saying, Malimu, that yes. lowering the grades is not an option. Yes. What we can do, and uh, maybe I can speak of my own experience. Uh, I went to Lamu mm. and Tana River, yes. and I've had to sponsor, personally, 100 teachers mm -hmm. to go to college so, that they, can, so that they can go back, back and be teachers in, in, the, uh, same area. in, mm. the, in the locality, because they understand the locality is better. Mm. So maybe we can open up opportunities for people who want to train as teachers from those areas and look at a mechanism where we can provide bursaries so that we can encourage more people from those localities with challenges to turn up for teaching. For teaching yeah. And then we can add what you have suggested, that we can also uh, provide uh, maybe what you call hardship allowance so that they can teach in those, in in those, those typical, areas. typical areas. Yes, I thank, agree with thank you. Thank you very much for your thoughts. Maybe you. uh, okay. my good brother here. Uh, Malimo. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Moses Wetangula. <laughs> <laughs> I went thank to you, a day school yes. from, from one to four. And I agree with you that uh, there is... Uh, no difficult at all in people succeeding through day schools. Mm -hmm. Now, some one, two years ago, or probably three, there was a big shake-up of teachers being uprooted from one region to another, from one county to another, in a process called delocalization. And uh, the complaints I've been having is that this has split families, has created a lot of difficulties, especially for elder teachers. A man of your age is uprooted from home and taken 200, 300 kilometers away without a family. You now have to live a bachelor life and so on. How has this impacted on the production from these teachers? And going forward, what would be your thoughts okay. in how to deal with this situation? I once visited TSC and uh, I was told by senior officials there that they don't want to have 
teacher couples teaching in the same schools. Yet when we were going to school, and those days were missionary days, you found there was a white man and his wife in the same school teaching very well without any issues and making us pass exams. What do you think we need as Kenya Kwanza government to address this issue so that uh, teachers are not only well remunerated, but they also are comfortable in their family lives and therefore more productive? Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 that's a very good question and uh, it's something that has been very emotive. Eh? Number one, a teacher is uh, a national resource. A trained teacher is a national resource. I believe that the right point of, um, of uh, uh, we wouldn't like to use the word delocalization, the right time to nationalize this teacher is at, at the point of employment. Because the teacher is younger, the teacher is energetic, yeah, uh, and is ready to venture into various areas. Uh, I take myself as an example. When I graduated in 1986, uh, my first posting was on Rusinga Island. Rusinga Island. Uh, I was a lawyer there. There was no other lawyer. Uh, there were lawyers. <laughs> so I was interacting with the parents who could not even talk Kiswahili. When I became a deputy, I was forced to learn Luo. Yeah? So that I'm able to communicate. But today, when I was moved to Machakos, I have now taken four years. I cannot communicate in Kikamba because of my age. <laughs> you see? So the right point of a place of nationalization is at the point of employment. The teacher will interact with the local community there. The teachers are energetic. They will venture. They will end up marrying. And it will also help in uh, integration. So that as the teachers become older, they are moved closer home. <laughs> that is what uh, I, I, I would feel. Uh, so that when you reach 55 years, uh, the, 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 the employer should now start thinking of uh, taking you closer uh, home so that you can, uh, uh, you can uh, take a rest uh, instead of traveling very long distances. That is why, um, as you said, uh, in some cases, those who are delocalized uh, were demoralized, and uh, it contributed to uh, a little bit of... Uh, uh, it affected their performance. Uh, it is only those uh, who maybe had had an experience of working away from home that uh, did not feel it much, though they felt it. Uh, so if, it, if we nationalize the teacher at the point of employment, it would be much better than having allowed the teacher to work at home, uh, grown there. Then, uh, of course, when it comes to issues of management uh, of our institutions, uh, then again, we need to think, because the issues of management, a good manager uh, would be available for, for the country. Yeah? So maybe at management point, uh, and uh, we need to look at the age at that point of management. If you are moving somebody at the age of 55, uh, they were a good manager. That becomes a challenge psychologically, spiritually uh, to him. But if this manager is around uh, 40 years, uh, you, can, you can easily move. So two points. Uh, at the point of employment, at level of management, but at management, we look at the age. Yes. So, so Mwalimu, I think that's a very important, and if you've, you've said yourself, it's, uh, it's a rather controversial issue. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think, and uh, first, I, I think you have agreed that teachers or teaching or teachers are a national resource. Yes. So the nationalization agenda is okay. It's okay. But at what point is now what we need 
what we need to work out. Yes. Right? Uh, instead of making it punitive, instead of making it punitive, can, it, can we turn it around and say a teacher who is willing to serve away from their county or their home gets an allowance for participating in the nationalization agenda? That is very true. Maybe that way we can achieve the intention of uh, creating a national uh, teaching uh, body. Uh, we force. have teachers without yeah. borders. Without borders. <laughs> yeah. Without necessarily making it look like punitive. Punitive, yeah. Yeah. Mm. In all fairness, it shouldn't appear that uh, when you are moving this teacher, it shouldn't appear as a punishment. Yes. It should be that your services are actually now needed here. And yeah. if you are ready to take and, it up. And, and it should yeah, be voluntary, be number voluntary, one. Yes. And it should have some incentives. It should have incentives. Yeah, that I am, I am willing to participate in the, in the nationalization agenda. Yes. And I'm because willing to teach away from home. That is true. Maybe we give you a special consideration. That is true. Because if you look at uh, the UNESCO charter, uh, they look at teaching and a teacher for the locality, you know, because the teachers should understand the culture, should understand the, uh, the morals of the area, you know. Uh, so you find when he's in his own local or her own local community, uh, they will be comfortable. So if they have to move into a new community to start interacting with a different culture, uh, then we should incentivize that one. With you. So, um, as Kenya Kwanzaa, we is working okay thank you so your suggestion is that we should um, we should explore how we can carry out this nationalization agenda first at employment level secondly we try and uh, make it voluntary and thirdly, we incentivize the, the process so that people who feel they want to participate in this national agenda, which is a very positive agenda, they can then maybe get uh, an incentive, maybe a small stipend or an allowance so that we can promote the same value without necessarily making it look like it is punitive. agree with you. Yep. On again. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah uh, uh, yes, we come from the same village. <laughs> <laughs> same. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, one, slightly deviating. Um, as the head of uh, the Heads Association and a practitioner in matters of education. There is something that is interesting um, and we need to just get some clarification. What 
is the level of the crisis of drug abuse. In Hello? Okay. Yeah. What is the level of the drug abuse crisis? And uh, two, uh, what measures have educational institutions been putting in place to deal with the drug menace? Um, and three, um, we have seen uh, in the political arena, there are some people who are now masquerading on the basis that they will allow uh, a certain form of drug to become uh, commercialized. <laughs> um, you know, this is a very serious matter, I believe, but as a practitioner, yes. what would you want to say about this and uh, what are the dangers that we are looking at? Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, as I said, uh, we have boards of management uh, that uh, need to be empowered to perform their mandate. One of their mandate is ensuring a disciplined institution. Today, our biggest challenge in schools, and especially secondary schools, is the issue of drug and drug abuse. And the biggest uh, drug that is abused is uh, cannabis uh, bank. The challenge is we are not able sometimes uh, to, to, to prove uh, because sometimes when you catch them even smoking and they throw it maybe in a pit latrine, you have no evidence. And uh, the law will always ask for evidence. And that is why, as Kenya Secondary School Aids Association, we started a debate that we want random drug testing in schools. I know people don't like it, uh, but we will need to take that bold step. Because if we can subject our sportsmen and women to random drug testing when they are off events or within season, they are tested. And if they are found culpable, uh, they are maybe banned for four years, isn't it, or more. Why are we finding it very difficult to look at our laws and change and make it mandatory? Because that is the only evidence uh, we can have to sanction a child. But the issue of drugs is real. But we have no laws that are helping educational institutions to fight the manners. The only thing we will have is we suspend. When, uh, when we suspend, uh, they will come back. If you want to isolate them from the school, the process is laborious. And the Education Act goes ahead and empowers the minister to ensure that all school-going children remain in school. So even when you recommend to the minister that this child needs to be isolated and taken to maybe another institution, the minister will write back and say, you readmit. Because the law also does not allow him to isolate children. What are we proposing? We have been saying we must reintroduce and build the capacity of our Boston institutions. Where this way, children uh, under, in drugs, children whose discipline is just wayward, can be taken to those institutions, where they can continue learning, and measures of uh, discipline are undertaken. So that we leave the regular schools to manage the regular students. Those that have already proved to be unmanageable, then the teachers have no capacity to manage them. Let them go to an institution where we have people trained to manage such students and at the same time allowed to continue. So when we recommend as principal, isolate this one from this community, we expect government to now pick that student and take that student to an institution that can now manage him better or her, but allow the students to continue learning. So that is the challenge we have been having, but it is a, a big problem. I know one 
Uh, one parent uh, asked me just recently uh, when we were dealing with the case and he asked me, now Malimu, when, uh, when uh, somebody takes over and uh, this is going to be grown, what will you do when they smoke? Uh, I said, I'll wait until he, he takes over and allows people to smoke. But if he does not allow people to smoke, we shall still punish those who will smoke. Because the, he will only have a policy of growing, but not smoking. Thank you. Malim, <laughs> sorry we've taken uh, too long with you. No, it's okay. Uh, when uh, we were growing up, there was always the disciplinary measures taken by teachers. Yes. The can. Yes. The Children's Act outlawed the can. Yes. And I keep receiving parents when I'm at home who say, Mushmiwa, my child is looking like he's going astray. I want you to help me take this child to school for the teachers to punish him for me. And he's still looking for the can. What are your thoughts about the levels of disciplinary measures that need to be taken? Because some of these children, when they start engaging in bad habits, testing ganja or bangi as it's called, when you arrest this situation through some form of punishment, they change. Because you can't just kick out every child who smoked bang to go to an institution when you could even have corrected them. What are your thoughts about uh, levels of disciplining children in schools? Thank you. Um, the issue of uh, discipline, I think, is uh, very challenging today. Um, the cane, as uh, it, was, uh, it was there when we went to school. Uh, but you'll agree with me also, um, it was sometimes wrongly used and uh, it ended up injuring students. And that is why it became a national conversation, international, until it was outlawed. But when the Children's Act was introduced, we failed to do one thing. We did not develop regulations to operationalize that Children's Act in learning institutions. And since there were no regulations, the teacher was left vulnerable to the act. So that even if I, I slapped the child or I quarreled the child, they are all classified as corporal punishment. So that has made it very difficult. And parents and the children know that uh, I cannot be abused, I cannot be slapped, I cannot be caned. And when I'm caned, I raise it up with the Teacher Service Commission. Teacher Service Commission follows the law, you will be interdicted. So we need to first operationalize that. Secondly, um, the guidance and counseling uh, uh, issues, we are always told guide and counsel. But guidance and counseling is not one off. It is a process. That process takes time. The teacher in charge of that department also has another teaching load. So provision of guidance and counseling services in our institutions are not to the level that is required. Because those given that responsibility have the other uh, teaching subjects which they need to attend to. So they spare very little time, maybe at games time. That is not enough. Yeah? So it would be important that as we strengthen this uh, guidance and counseling, maybe uh, government can employ professionally trained guidance and counseling people attached to the school, and let the teachers do their responsibility to teach 
the subjects they trained in. But we have professional counselors within the institution. Thank you very much, Mualimu, for your wealth of uh, Thank you. Um, ideas. I think the takeaway we get from you on that particular subject is maybe we need to look at the Children's Act regulations yes. and to see how it can be customized in schools yes. to help the teachers uh, assist the students to, especially on matters of discipline, in a, in a manner that uh, the parents and the teachers um, are involved so yes. that we can have discipline in schools. Good. Without necessarily bringing back all the cane okay. issues and all the other things. That I think there could be other mechanisms uh, that can apply. be put in the regulations that can assist schools to run uh, better, especially on matters of discipline to students. True. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you also. It's, a, it's an honor to engage, to engage with uh, Your Excellency and with the party leaders. You know, sometimes we can wave from far, but this kind of... <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and may God bless you. <laughs>